Hi, I'm Jerry Wise. I'm a therapist from Family Tree Counseling Associates in Carmel, Indiana. And this video is entitled, Do Opposites Attract? I've been working with marriages and couples for 34 years. And I wanted to bring some of that experience to the question of, Do Opposites Attract? I've worked with couples uh, in a premarital way, in a pastoral counseling way, marriage and family therapy way, in divorce therapy, couples who have had multiple relationships and multiple marriages and gone through the cycles of couples finding someone they're attracted to and talking about the issue of attraction and attachment. One client asked me recently, well, Jerry, don't opposites attract? And actually I answered yes and no. In this video, I'd like to share with you uh, both answers. For us couple therapists, it's about the science of attraction and attachment. Now, there are lots of ways that we can be alike, similar, different, opposite, uh, for example, physical attractiveness, money, the desire for children and family life, religion, class or socioeconomic background, education, um, e even humor, and many other ways. In some ways, opposites can pique our interest, and we can sometimes be interested in partners who may fulfill a weakness of ours or fulfill a part of us that's not really norm for us. Uh, or they may be somebody who brings something novel or new to our life because that's not something we've developed. And so in that way, opposites may attract. Uh, you have something that I don't have and I find that very interesting and attractive. For example, Bob is a quiet shy and kind of a nerd, and he may meet Kathleen, who is more social, verbal, more outgoing. Bob is attracted to this opposite, in quotes, because he hopes this will fill him out or complete him as a person. He has hopes or a fantasy for that. Kathleen may even see Bob as somebody she could work on to try to change and fill him out and, and make him more complete by helping him be more social and outgoing. And she may see him as a great change project for her. And she finds that very interesting. But he's very opposite to her in that way. And so she engages or finds him attractive. And, uh, again, she is hopeful that he can overcome his shyness and be social like she is. Unfortunately, five years into the relationship, Kathleen now is complaining that Bob never wants to go out. He never wants to do anything. He doesn't socialize. He's just not very friendly. Um, and this is now a constant source of their friction. Um, and, and for them as a couple, they, this is, becomes a reason to argue. And then Bob grows in resentment for Kathleen, and the very dreams they had in the beginning, or unspoken fantasies or dreams they had about the relationship, now are the very things that are causing them some conflict. Uh, Bob is always feeling like Kathleen wants to fix him and wants to fix him into somebody that she'd like him to be or that he should be when actually that was part of what attracted uh, Kathleen to him because she thought he thought well maybe she will help me develop that side of me so in those unspoken contracts and unspoken parts of our relationship opposites may attract in that way uh, we can think maybe about Steve and Renee as an example. Renee is very money conscious and has great money management skills and has done that all of her life. She grew up in a home where money and money management was very important. Steve has always had trouble with financial responsibility and always had some struggles in that area and kind of has been kind of underemployed or, or doesn't spend his money quite uh, as uh, maturely as he should. And so, in some ways, that those opposites with each other are attractive to them. 
unfortunately, the very things that attract us to one another often become later the very things we argue about and the very thing that pulls us apart. That is not uncommon for marriages. If that's happening to you, you need to get some help because there are resolutions for that. Because there are issues that need to be resolved. So, now if each couple can let each partner enrich the relationship and use that balance, then their marital life uh, can improve in that they each have some complementary uh, skills, abilities, uh, character, uh, uh, desires that actually fill out them as a couple and can make them more enriched and more rounded. But let me tell you what really matters in terms of attraction and attachment for a couples. What really matters in how couples deal with the differences or the oppositeness and the samenesses in their relationship, and what really matters is not the opposites, but that sameness is what attracts. And that's what I want to talk about more in this video. So forget the opposites attract myth, which tends to be more uh, a common way of thinking. Actually, the science, uh, the science would tell us that there's a new study that finds that when it comes to personality, people seek partners with the, their same qualities, but claim to want someone who is different. But like-minded people validate each other um, and each other's beliefs and views, and they're, uh, and they're... Let me share with you the self-differentiation scale used by those who think in a family systems way and discuss how self-differentiation is critical for understanding how relationships work. And when I talk about sameness attracts, what I mean is the scale of self-differentiation has levels and one level of self-differentiation is attracted to the same level of self-differentiation. And each of us find ourselves somewhere on this scale on a 0 to 10 scale. The lower end of the scale, we find ourselves with a more immature type of relationship to intimacy. We find it hard to tolerate intimacy or closeness. We tend to be reactive. We tend towards counterdependency and codependency. We also experience more enmeshment. Uh, our I-ness and we-ness is out of balance in our lives. And when we experience that, then we're more on the one, two, three lower end of the scale. This comes about as a result of our family of origin imprinting and the functioning that we have within our family of origin. Then as we move up the scale up towards the 10 mark, and again, I don't know that anybody's really a 10 or anybody's really a zero, but if you can think in this way, useful kind of model to think about relationships, on the 10 scale, we have strong self-esteem, someone who can manage togetherness and separateness in a very healthy and mature way. They know how to balance we-ness and I-ness in a relationship. They can experience and tolerate healthy intimacy, and they have an ability and a capacity for sustained intimacy. Whereas down here in the lower end, we just have a lot more allergy to intimacy, we're more reactive, we just, our self esteem issues really get into the mix of things, and it makes us, makes it harder for us to maintain that kind of uh, experience of healthy, calm intimacy in a relationship. And so we have this scale. And so the sameness that attracts is like this. Those who are two on this scale are not attracted to an eight. Any more than a seven is attracted to a one. 
we just wouldn't feel comfortable with that person. And in fact, we wouldn't even feel that chemistry. Whereas the two and the two would feel very much a very strong chemistry. The two and the seven would not. And so when I talk about sameness attracts, it really is we are attracted to someone who holds a similar level of differentiation and a similar level of self-esteem. And so that's why we're very much alike when we pick someone to be a partner. It is highly unusual and very difficult for someone who's a nine to be with a one. And oftentimes we believe the myth that that happens. Oh, well, I'm really an eight, but my wife is really a one. Or, you know, my husband is such a two, but I'm really an eight. Actually, in terms of self-differentiation and the deep, basic sense of self, you're not. And if you come in, we can talk about that and uh, make more sense regarding that truth. So I want to share with you, as I've shared, the old saying, opposites attract, is really kind of a myth. Um, and that it there is some basis for it, but when it really comes down to what matters, like attracts like. And that our level of self-differentiation and our level of self-esteem, a basic sense of ourselves and knowing ourselves will attract or be attracted to a like level of self-differentiation and self-esteem and a like level of ability to be intimate or not ability to be intimate or a like level of a capacity for intimacy and closeness or non-capacity for an intimacy of closeness. What I find is that many operate under the myth that, oh no, I enjoy, I can enjoy a sig significant amount of closeness, as the codependent would say. Well, what happens is they lose the closeness because of their fusion and enmeshment. And so they think they're being close when they're actually being fused or enmeshed. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing as intimacy or healthy intimacy. But it seems like I can really do that, but my spouse can't do it. So I'm the healthy one because I can enmesh and he can't. Actually, that's far from the truth. And I think there's more that uh, can be shared on that topic. If you want to know more, give me a call at 317-919-6264 or www.familytreecounseling.com. And thanks for listening.